Big T were children of indigenous women and European fur traders in the Red River area, now known as Manitoba. It dates back to as early as 1973 during the Alexander Mackenzie expedition. The Métis people developed their own language called Michiv, which is a unique blend of French and the Cree language that is still used today. Roughly 33% of all Canada's Aboriginal population is Métis. Métis means mixed. The Métis Nation Blue Infinity Flag is the oldest continuous used flag in Canada and it represents the mixing of two cultures. Métis were often called flower beadwork people due to their combination of French floral embroidery mixed with Aboriginal porcupine quilt work. Métis are well known for their finger woven sash, which is referred to as l'assumption sash, and it is the most recognizable symbol of Métis heritage. A sash was often used as a belt, tow rope, tump line, or even as a sewing kit. They're made of wool. Louis Riel was a Canadian politician, a founder of the province of Manitoba, and a political leader of the Métis people. He led two resistance movements against the government of Canada and its first prime minister, John A. Macdonald. Riel sought to defend Métis rights and identity as the Northwest Territories came progressively under the Canadian sphere of influence. Louis Riel Day is on November 16th. The Métis Nation of British Columbia was founded in 1996 and is still going strong today. Well, Jerry, first I wanted to say um, thank you for participating in the uh, Northeast BC Métis storytelling. Uh, this project is basically geared towards sharing uh, stories from elders or anybody in the community that can share wisdom uh, so that future generations and uh, whether it be family members or other uh, Métis citizens can, you know, um, get to know that knowledge and so that it, it doesn't get lost uh, once, you know, gener as generations come and go. So that's what this um, project is about. So that being said, why don't we start uh, talking a little bit about uh, you and maybe sharing some of those stories. But let's just uh, start with your first name and last name and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, my name is Jerry Cardinal. Okay, per perfect. And uh, do you, were you named after someone? Not really. It's just just a name that came out of the hat, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. And uh, what about uh, your family name, Cardinal? Do you know where it comes from? My family name is originally from northern Alberta. Okay. And I believe it goes way, probably way back to uh, Manitoba. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, do you have any nicknames? I have a nickname. My, my uh, Cree nickname is uh, Maikan, which means wolf. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, and um, your uh, lineage, do, can, do you know anything about uh, the lineage of your parents? We'll start there. My, my parents were both born in northern Alberta, in a place called Conklin, Alberta. Back in, my dad was born in 1925, and I believe my mom was born in 1932, I believe, somewhere there. And what about uh, your mom? My mother was very active in this community. Her name was Agnes Cardinal, and she recently passed away here, I believe it was last year, on October the 4th, in, in Edmonton, Alberta. And where was she born? She was born in Conklin, Alberta. As well, okay. Sorry if I missed that before. Um, and um, what about your grandparents? Do you know where they were born? My, I believe my grandparents were born up around northern, northern Alberta too. Okay. So on you're both, both on, on, yeah, on both sides of my, my dad and mom's side. Okay. And I guess I forgot to ask you, when were you born? I was born on May 22nd, 1954 in Fort McMurray, Alberta, in a hospital called Gabriel Dumont Hospital. Oh, wow. Yeah, named after Gabriel Dumont. <laughs> okay. It is still standing today as a historic building in Fort McMurray. Oh, is it? Yeah. Wow. Um, now, that being said, uh, did you spend uh, a chunk of your uh, childhood in Fort McMurray? I spent mo most of my childhood in Conklin, Alberta. Okay. Because my dad worked for NAR, Northern Alberta Railway, and during the summer holidays, we'd move to different, uh, like the different little towns, right from Edmonton to between Fort McMurray, places like Boyle, Alberta, Caslin. Okay. Like, and there was lots of Métis people where we were, uh, like we were, where we'd go and stay for the summer. Oh, that's good. And um, now that being said, um, are you Métis or non-status? I'm Métis. You're Métis, okay. 
And uh, I, you mentioned earlier that uh, your name, your, you have a nickname which translates into uh, Cree, from, or that comes from Cree. Yep. But uh, are you Cree, Dene, Beaver, or any other of the other groups? Like with, with me, I, I, uh, I do understand the Cree language and I do speak it. Yep. So basically it's just uh, like, like most Métis people speak Cree, eh? It's, okay. it's, it's just something, and plus it's mixed in with French. So, oh. so a lot, like a lot of it, like with my side of the family, like it is mixed in. Gotcha. Like for instance, uh, a cloth, a dish cloth that you use for uh, washing dishes, we call it lullavet. And in English, it's called a dish cloth, I guess. Yeah. So, so it's so many different ways of saying these uh, mischief words. Gotcha. That are mixed in with both yeah. languages. Okay. And um, do you recall any interesting stories from your birth at the hospital there? Uh, no. The only thing I could remember is, I don't remember, but me, uh, my parents telling me when I was just a young infant, like I couldn't keep my food down. So they had to take me to Edmonton. I had surgery right across my abdomen here. Oh, wow. So I got a big scar. Actually, I got a scar here like a, a cross. <laughs> wow, look at that. And uh, okay, well then let's start maybe with some of your childhood memories. Uh, what was it like for you growing up? What do you remember? Me growing up in Concord was awesome. Like, you know, like I, I come from a big family which some of us have passed on, but like growing up with brothers that go out in the bush and hunt, we had our own guns, our own 22s. You know, dad would give us, buy us, uh, you know, shells to last us for until the next go around. Wow. Yeah, so we couldn't target practice. If we did, we'd have to tell them. But so those guns were basically for killing chickens and rabbits. Anything that we killed in the bush, we ate. So the one thing we never did was try to kill squirrels. The only time we killed squirrels was in the winter time because we can stretch them out and sell them for candy. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> and uh, how many uh, siblings do you have? There was uh, 12 of us, six, six girls and six boys. But my parents raised one of my, uh, one of my nieces. So almost like 13 then? Yeah, so 13 of us. And where were you in that uh, lineage? There? I believe I was, let's see, I was the fourth oldest. Fourth oldest? Yeah. Okay. And what was that like, being the fourth oldest? Well, no, I guess it basically is just like anybody else. I mean, uh, I was treated, you know, okay. Actually, maybe before we get into a little bit of uh, your later years, why don't we, why don't I ask you, when did you then move to Chetwind? I first came here to visit my parents in 1979. Okay. Uh, my parents moved here in 1976. Okay. Because my dad was working with BC Rail at that time. I came to visit him here in, seven, in 1979 and I stayed for two weeks. So, and after that, I actually, I was married at that time and I got divorced and after my divorce, I came here in 1980. So I've been here since 1980. Oh, wow, okay. And um, what was your first language spoken at home? My first language was Cree. Cree, yeah. Okay. And um, compared to, you know, 1980 to, till now, has, would you say that life has changed a lot for you here since you've been here? Or has it remained pretty much the same? Basically with me, it's just uh, maybe changed a little bit, but not, not that much. But ever since my parents have died, like I have uh, no one really to, you know, communicate in our language. But except for the people from Mobley Lake, which I, you know, do talk to in their language, Cree. And what about your siblings? Did you guys not communicate in Cree? There's only about, uh, my oldest sister speaks Cree, and the other, my brother, the one that's here visiting, like we all, under, they understand Cree and speak it a little bit, but not as, uh, not as much as like uh, some of us do. Like when we're together, we will, you know, speak our, our language, the Cree language. Oh, that's nice. And um, what did your uh, parents do to support the family growing up? Uh, my dad uh, uh, worked railroad. He was a railroad man 
and my mother was a stay at home until she moved until they moved here and she worked in the hotel as a chambermaid as they would say now today yep and did you um growing up did you have to uh work to support help support the family as well well basically uh yeah when i when i started working actually i started working with bc rail in 1972 and i left there in 96 because of health issues with my back and yeah i was i i, I helped support just just like the rest of them good good now i think you mentioned earlier on that you guys would all you know were you would hunt right can you tell me a little bit about that what would you guys hunt well, we'd like we'd go hunt our rabbits like after school, you know. We'd kill them and clean them. Same with the chickens, grouse chickens, spruce hens, clean them. And that's going out, you know, about a couple miles away from home. I mean, everybody in the community that I was raised in in Conklin, you know, did that for a living. Like, and and come fall, uh, you know, the the men of the community, you know, they'd kill them loose, and they'd, you know, separate the meat, you know, give it to the uh, Elders would always come first with the moose meat. Like they would be given moose meat. Yeah. And this is what my dad would do. Like when he'd kill a moose, the elders in that community would, you know, get a good, good chunk of moose meat. Yep, of course. And have you yourself continued to hunt uh, since those days? Till this day, no. Like, no, I, I go hunting in IGA. <laughs> <laughs> or go to the butcher block in Dawson. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, well, uh, what about um, family life yourself, Jerry? Are you married or are you single? Right now, yeah, I'm in common law. Common law? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, I'm uh, in common law for over 30 years. So. 30 years? Yeah. And uh, tell us about that. When did you meet your partner? I met my partner in 1991, I believe in February, <laughs> I think somewhere around there. Oh, wow. Uh, and, uh, and we've been together ever since. So. What's her name? Uh, her name is Marie. Marie? Yeah. Okay. And is she uh, First Nations as well? She's a First Nations. She's a member of the Soto Band here in Mobley Lake. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. And um, did you um, at home? Did you guys establish any uh, traditions, whether you know whether it be Soto or Métis or anything like that? Our, our traditions were mo you know like mostly gathering, like like Christmas, Thanksgiving, and, and Easter, and these and, and these stuff and. And my parents, they used to love listening to their fiddle music, eh? like through the radio or uh, a CD or the, or an old cassette tape. Like, so, so that was awesome to hear that. Yeah. And did you and Marie have children? No, we don't have no kids. No. Okay, sounds good. And um, so you said you worked uh, for the railway. Uh, where else uh, have you worked? I've done a lot of little... You know, like uh, I've worked with contractors, but working with contractors, like, uh, you know, working with a contractor, yeah, you get your money, but you don't get a pension or anything out of it. Eh? In order to get a good job these days, you get, you get on with a corporation like I did, like with BC Rail or BC Hydro or the sawmills around here, town like Canfor, West Fraser, or the highway department. So yeah, I've worked with a few contractors where you just got paid and that was it. And what about uh, Marie? Did Marie was she, did, was she uh, stay at home? Uh, no, Mar Marie was, Marie was always a worker. Like she was always working. So she was uh, a camp attendant. Plus she worked in the hotels around here. And plus she taught for a year up in Mobley Lake with assist with the assistant up at the up at the Learning Center over there in Mobley. Oh, that's, a, that's awesome. Now, in your life, um, would you say um, that your would you say that your dad or mom influenced you the most, or did you have like a parent or a sibling that was very influential uh, throughout your life? I think our parents were always encouraged us to go get involved with the Métis, especially when we like when growing up in Edmonton. That's where I really got involved with the Métis at a young age. We formed the first Métis dance group in Edmonton, which is known today as the Edmonton Métis Dancers. And uh, my brother and my sister, two of my sisters, we were involved in that group dance. And it still exists today with, you know, young kids 
dancing today from in, in Edmonton. Wow, that's amazing. So would you say that your parents influenced you to, you know? Well, oh yeah, they influenced us to do like, like be, uh, ra being raised in Conklin, like uh, during the festival season, like uh, New Year's, we used to have uh, Métis dances that would go for a week or so every night. And this is where we, you know, we'd go do our jigging and square dancing. And it was awesome just to see, you know, to see that when I was young. And I don't see that today. Like, it's not too, it's not too often where you get a Métis gathering. Like, not, not like a long time ago. Yeah. It's changed a lot with, with Métis stuff like that. Yep. Now, um, are there any traditions or any particular things that you know, you find yourself doing today that were passed down to you from your parents or your grandparents? I, yeah, I, I, I uh, do smudge at home. I'm also a pipe carrier now today, which is something that was passed on to me from my older brother, that he, he's gone now, so and the last time I seen him, we had a good talk, and he said, I think it's time for you to, you know, do what I've been doing. And, and you, you like you know what to do and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so this is what like yeah I, I I go out in the bush. I got a brother here today that will be going out in the bush tomorrow and you know pick our pick our stuff from the bush. Good, good. And um, growing up, uh, did you have any certain responsibilities you know at home yourself? Well, no, basically just making sure that, you know, like, we survived <laughs> okay. in that, and, and but going back in those days, like, it's, you know, coming from a big family is, you know, you, you had to be there to experience something like that. We're growing up with 12 kids in the house, and it was awesome. Good, good. And um, do you recall any uh, big changes in your in your life or and you know any changes i guess maybe uh even throughout your life that stick out as maybe as something that you'd want to pass on that you experienced i think my big change in my life is when i got involved with the metis politics back in uh, 20 uh, 1999 and from there on like i still get phone calls you know asking for some advice like a little bit of consultant and that was something big like you know traveling from here to winnipeg you know on a monthly basis and going to vancouver victoria with meetings you know like in this area so i was uh, originally the second regional director in this region when when they first got incorporated as a, as an well may as well say as a nation eh? mm -hmm. And the council that I sat on was the Métis Provincial Council of BC as a regional director for Region 7. And that was something that, you know, really got me, got me back more, more involved, whereas I used to just sit back and say, yeah, yeah, you know, let the younger kids do it. And today this is what, like, uh, you know, if they, if they ever see this anywhere, you know, it would be so nice to see young kids get involved like get involved in here with this office here today, mm -hmm. like with, with more more younger youth coming in here. Mm -hmm. And this is what we need: the younger generation today that you know have graduated, and the Métis kids that graduated, you know, come here, come here, come and you know sit in this office for a while. Yeah. Learn our culture. Of course. And so speaking of kids and you know and graduation, did you yourself uh, attend uh, school growing up? Yeah, I attended high school in Edmonton. Okay. And I left in grade 11. Grade 11? Yeah. Okay. And did you do any schooling after that? Um, well, I actually tried, but I never did okay. you know, continue on. Yeah, no worries. And um, what do you recall as some difficult times back when you were uh, growing up, perhaps? I guess difficult times is seeing, you know, a lot of our elders passing away, like uh, knowing that knowledge is gone from us. But I think that's, you know, like, I've never, in my family, like, it's always, we were, you know, close to one another. But to see uh, tough times like that, some like some other families where alcohol and drugs were involved in families, I didn't see that in my family. It was totally different. Like, we, we were raised 
uh, you know, to go to church. And we were, you know, today we hear about these, uh, you know, what is it, uh, survivors from these residential schools. Uh, we never got involved. I mean, we weren't sent to these schools when we were raised in Conklin. I mean, three of my uncles were from my dad's side, which the stories that I heard from them was, you know, like something that I don't think anybody would want to be in as, as a kid growing up. Yeah. You know, it's, it's trauma to them. So we, we never experienced that. And my dad said my, my kids would never go in to something like that. What did you uh, do for play? Did you, uh, did you have any hobbies growing up? Oh yeah, I played hockey, baseball. That's when I moved to Edmonton where we started, you know, getting really involved in uh, sports. But we did our sports in Conklin, like our baseball, uh, just, re you know, wreck ball and go stuff like that. Skating up and down the creek, which is about five miles long, go five miles one way and go five miles one back. So it was, it was awesome. It's a long race, that's pretty cool. And, um... Let's talk about maybe about uh, your involvement in the community. Uh, now you said you were part of some uh, board board of directors before, or sorry, the, the council. I uh, yeah, like the Métis Provincial Council, BC. <coughs> when when actually I started out as just as a representative of this community, traveling back and forth to meetings here in Fort Saint John and Dawson Creek, getting set up to open an office here in Chetwin, which the first. The Métis office was located by the liquor store. It was called the Little, I think it was the Little Prairie Métis office. And attending meetings all over and trying to get funding put together so we can open up an office. And, you know, and we eventually we did that. The funding came through with that. What, I guess, uh, inspired you to want to participate in that? I just, uh, like one day here, the, the this is when they first started uh, with the uh, Métis Provincial Council. They had a meeting at the Friendship Center with uh, the person that was running for the, for the president of the Métis Nation of uh, BC, so, uh, a Métis Provincial Council of BC back then. So I went to the meeting there and, and there was a few people there. And from there they were asking if there was, you know, anything going on in here in town in which we say, yeah. And, but most of the time, everything was done from Prince George South. And if you had to get involved with the Métis, you'd have to travel to Prince George to participate. So when that started back in, uh, what, 1999 or 2000, when everything went provincial-wide, and uh, they wanted somebody to represent the community of Chetwin, so I stepped forward <laughs> and just said, OK. So we started uh, what, uh, what is a Northeast Métis Management Committee with each individual coming from Fort Nelson, Fort St. John, and Dawson Creek, and Puskupi, Taylor, Hudson Hope, and, and the little areas. And we'd all meet in Dawson Creek. So this is where we all, you know, everybody got started there and got their funding from there to start an office in each one of these communities. So it was just something, this, it was all political and it was all <laughs> to do it. I mean, uh, I, in my language, I call it sunyas, money. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, fair enough. A lot of decisions to be made with yeah. money. Yeah. Um, now, do you recall um, any maybe exciting times during your community uh, participation? Maybe during those days? I think my, my exciting time is when, uh, like, when Dave would put up uh, something here to do with Métis, eh? and uh, I know Darlene and and uh, and you know, other people in town here, you know, got something going. I, I was I, I was excited to see that, you know, like seeing these people starting taking over and doing, you know, like what I've seen all over this country with, you know, uh, Métis participation and and gatherings where they got fiddle players and dance groups and people jigging. So, yeah, even I got up and went and did my couple steps of jigging when Darlene had their function here up at the rec center. So it was awesome. That's, 
that just brought out the life in me. When I hear, when I hear the fiddle playing, my feet will start, will start moving. So it's just something I enjoy doing. Wow, that's awesome. And um, do you, did you yourself play any instruments? No, I know how to play the guitar, maybe ECG, which is just normal for anybody to play. But other than that, no, I, I would have loved to pick up the fiddle and learn how to play the fiddle. Because my dad, you know, played it, but not as frequent as he did. He'd, he'd sit in his room and play his fiddle, and we'd sit there and listen. Yeah, fair enough. Now, aside from your parents, were there any other relatives that you admired for their tradition or maybe like a skill or a craft that they had? I think it would be one of my mo my mom's uncles who stayed with us for a while and did his education in Edmonton and, you know, became a geologist. And he really, uh, he really stepped the ladder up for us young guys and saying, well, if he can do it, you know, we can do what he can do. So I think, uh, yeah, my uncle Dan was uh, very, uh, he was, uh, just say he was a mentor to me. Admire. Yeah, I admire him. And plus one of my uncles from my dad's side, so. What did he do? Well, he was just uh, just an awesome, I call him a comedian. <laughs> he was somebody that was good to be around with. He was a big man. Well, he was about close to six feet tall, 300 pounds. Somebody good to be around with. Just somebody that I looked up to. Yeah. And um, aside from them, did you have any other supportive, like, or influential, like, elders, perhaps like your grandparents? I think, well, my, my, my grandpa, I love my grandpa dearly. I spent many, many uh, days in the bush with him. Uh, every uh, spring, he'd phone my mom in Edmonton and say, send that, send that kid up here. It's time to go in the bush, you know, like I'd spend two, two weeks at Easter break and with him in the bush, you know, hunting his beavers. Packed, packed a lot of beavers for my grandpa helped him build a cabin, one of the biggest cabins they ever seen that two people built. I mean, even I was impressed after we were done. The logs that we put on that cabin, that I, I couldn't believe we didn't. <laughs> even my uncles were saying, oh man, how did you guys do that? I don't know, we just did it. <laughs> just a lot of hard work. Yeah, yeah, we spent a month in the bush building that cabin, so. Wow. That's incredible. Um, and what were the di different uh, seasons like for your family? Like, did you get, did you guys have certain traditions, like you know, for the winter, summer, or Easter, or anything like that? Like you told me that you'd go see your grandpa there during Easter, but did you guys do something else for summer or winter? I think uh, at summertime, we're like, uh, we're like in Conklin when we grew up. It was always that uh, after all the things that have fully grown, like the berries and stuff. We'd go spend about two weeks in the bush and pick our berries to preserve during the winter months. And there was a few families would gather around, you know, and we'd stay in the bush and have lots of fun. Like I, like I tell you this, I, I, we don't see that today, where families go out in the bush and spend time with each other. Like, I, I don't know, I, I, maybe I know of a family in Dawson Creek that still does that today, like, so. Do you, did you yourself then continue any of these on your own? Oh, uh, no, no, like that's, that, everything today is just stay home and watch TV and why, and that's it, don't go anywhere. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, so I guess growing up then, you spent a lot of time on the land uh, with your grandpa and with your, with your siblings. Yeah. Do any of them still spend a lot of time on the land, like your siblings or any other family members? No, no. This, this is all way back, you know, back in the 60s and in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And that's all gone. If you go to Fort McMurray today, and it, it's the trap line that where I would spend my time with, m with my grandpa, I don't think it even exists today because of the oil that's being extracted from over there, all the tar sands. Like, I don't know. The last time I was there was with the funeral, and it totally changed. I know they had a big fire there one day, and I can just see myself running down from that hill as a kid. 
where I used to play, where that fire was. And I said, holy man. And I was telling Maria, uh, that's where I used to play as a kid, where that fire is going right now. Wow. And a couple of years, I think that happened, what, three years ago or so? So yeah, it's, yeah, it's totally different from today. Like, but for me, like as myself, like I haven't. As soon as Marie uh, leaves the apartment, I I put on my fiddle music and I, I'm sitting there tapping my feet, eh? Like so, I enjoy listening to fiddle music. It's just something that brings me back to where I was raised, and uh, think back of everything that I done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did. Aside from your the pipe that you said you recently started doing the smudging, do you have any other hobbies uh, that you uh, have started or just carried throughout your life? No, I just uh, I just live a good normal life today. Like I've been sober since what 1989, in November or so. I just uh, I just like to live today. No. Well, um, the last question I have here. But that'll maybe carry on with what uh, we just do at the end, which is say, you know, are there any stories that you'd like to pass on uh, yourself to any future generations? It, it doesn't have to be one from you, but maybe even a story that you heard from a relative that stuck with you all your life or anything like that? I, uh, the stories that I've heard from my el the elders that have passed on is like, uh, it's just, you know, like to live a good life and treat people, you know, the way they should be treated. I know at times we all treat each other, you know, shouldn't be that way, but hey man, these things happen in life and we move on and, you know, go out the door and continue on with your life. And just, I just, uh, you know, enjoy the way that I live today with my, with my sweet Marie, I call her. And if there was a, maybe a specific message that you could pass on to young generations right now, what would you say to them? I would tell them, you know, get involved. Get involved with the Métis, man. You know, we've been around for, I always say we've been around for over 300 years or longer. And we're here, like, I don't, we're not going anywhere. You know, this door here at uh, Moxton Flats here, Métis Society, it's open for you young people to come in. Come in here and, you know, sit around. Sit with Darlene or if somebody's here. You know, pick up the knowledge. Because our, uh, especially our language, the Michif Cree is, there's not too many of us around. Like I know you're gonna be interviewing Bill. Bill, you know, he speaks Cree and Blanche, Darlene, myself and and you know other people that are in town. I know there's a lot of Cree, you know, Cree and Soto at, at at the reserve who speak Cree, and a lot of that too. Like a lot of their elders are going. There's not too many elders left in Mobley too. Like here, I think the oldest Métis elder we got, I think, would be Bill now. Really? I think the last, the last, the last Métis elder, that was my mother. She was 89 years old. Wow. And Darlene got her involved with with a lot of things in town. A lot of things actually. Darlene got my mom motivated, you know, to go here. And if you're a young person, like, you want to pick up on the Métis stuff, go to Batash, man. And, and they have, that's uh, about half an hour, I believe, north of Saskatoon. Okay. Yeah, that's where they had that battle uh, with Louis Riel and with the, uh, with the government of Canada. So, you know, you go there, man, you're going to meet a lot of people. Like, thousands of Métis people are gathered there every year. It's awesome. It's a good positive experience. Oh, it's, it's something that, that you will talk about for a long time. I still talk about that today, which, like I said, I, I've been from here to Winnipeg, and I, I've seen the statue of Louis Riel, and, uh, you know, I've met so many different people who are involved with the Métis movement. It's, it's unbelievable. That's great. Well, unless you had any other advice or any stories to tell us, um, thank you for, for being a part of this, uh, Jerry. It means a lot to 
you know, be able to hear your story, hear your, your stories and your knowledge. Uh, and like I said, we, we, we want to pass this on to future generations and current generations for them to watch and learn uh, the good and the bad of, uh, I guess, of, of the culture and of the uh, lives that people have gone through here. So thank you. I just want to thank, uh, you know, Darlene for, you know, having me here. And it's been an honor and a privilege to sit with you. Marlon, is it? I call you Marlon the Magician. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, it's, it's been an honor and privilege to sit here with you and give you what I, you know, what, what I've been, you know, as a Métis, and most of all being a, a Métis, you know, being involved with the Métis movement since a young age. Get involved, young kids. Oh, and one more thing. Go get vaccinated, all you Métis people. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you.